serial killer. Two words that can paralyze a city, strike fear in an entire community, and put intense pressure on law enforcement to solve a crime. Through the years, we have covered the investigations and trials of some of the most notorious serial killers of the modern era, watching them inside the courtroom, studying their reactions and words, hoping to get some insight into their minds. Tonight, we take a look at serial killers and their families as we hear new conversations between Jeffrey Dahmer and his father. What is it that turns these men into killers? Is it nature or is it nurture? And what about serial killers who seem to be living conventional lives, married with children? What are their relationships like with their spouses and their children? Tonight, we bring in our experts to try to understand more about some of the most dangerous among us as we investigate the family lives of serial killers. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And I think for most of us, when we think about our priorities in our lives, it's family first, right? For most of us. Some people put their careers above. I understand God, church also in the mix, of course. Um, but a huge priority. And, and, you know, decisions we make and what we do is driven by our families. You know, sometimes you may work a little bit harder because you know um, someone at home needs something. Maybe um, you, you decide where you want to live because what's going to be best for your spouse, what's going to be best for your children. All these things, where you live, um, how you live, is driven for so many of us by family. It, it's family first. So what about their families, the families of serial killers? Because there are serial killers who have their own families. Like where, where, do, where, does, where does the family stack up in their lives? How does that, you work that relationship, right? You know, I, I come here and I work at Court TV, um, but when I go home, I'll talk about cases with, um, you know, my wife. I will talk about the business with my son, who's in, in, in the business as well of, of, of producing. And, you know, so it's not like it's a, it's not like, totally separate and you know they can watch me if they want I hope they're watching right um, so there's not this this like compartment uh, can't even say it um, different columns for for these parts of our lives different compartments right so kind of mixes over and and the family has something to do with it and you know for me choosing where I was working what jobs I would take, where I would go, what I would do, what I wouldn't do, driven by family. But, but for, for these guys, yeah, they also had jobs, I guess, and careers, but they also had this whole serial killing thing going on. So what about their families and that relationship? Exactly how, how did that work? We're going to take a look at that tonight. We're also going to take a look at where do these guys come from? Like, wh how do you end up? as a notorious serial killer? You know, is there something in the DNA? Is there some sort of defect that you're born with? Um, or are you a product of, of your environment? Are you the product of something that happened to you when you were a child, when you were growing up? Um, is it some sort of combination of things? And, and what, what sort of impact can your home life have on you becoming a really infamous killer, someone who is just literally just ki killing people, right? So you're destroying those lives and destroying the lives of, of all the, the, the families and friends of all these victims. Like, how does that happen? How do they get there? Something else we're going to talk about um, because we've got some some audio we're going to play for you, some, some recordings of Lionel Dahmer speaking with his son, Jeffrey Dahmer. This is a guy who 
at some point was raising a serial killer, right? At some point, right? You're, you're, if, it, if it's your child, I'm not saying it's your fault, but you are raising someone to a certain extent um, who becomes a serial killer. And what, it, what is that like? How does that happen? There's a lot of dynamics here that um, I don't think are 100% clear, and we're going to try to create some clarity tonight when we bring in our experts. Uh, but first, let's, let's take a look back. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer spoke at his sentencing, and we didn't get a, a necessarily a deep insight into him by the words that he, he spoke at this sentencing, but he has spoken in other times as well. Let's take a listen. In closing, I just want to say that I hope God has forgiven me. I know society will never be able to forgive me. I know the families of the victims will never be able to forgive me for what I have done. I promise I will pray each day to ask for their forgiveness when the hurt goes away, if ever. I have seen their tears, and if I could give my life right now to bring their loved ones back, I would do it. I am so very sorry. Your Honor, I know that you are about to sentence me. I ask for no consideration. I want you to know that I have been treated perfectly by the deputies who have been in your court and the deputies who work the jail. The deputies have treated me very professionally, and I want everyone to know that. They, they have not given me special treatment. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive an eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. I know my time in prison will be terrible, but I deserve whatever I get because of what I have done. Thank you, Your Honor, and I am prepared for your sentence, which I know will be the maximum. I ask for no consideration. So now what I want to play for you, and this is from um, a brand new series that's, that's, that's being released, a Fox Nation's docuseries, My Son Jeffrey, The Dahmer Family Tapes, conversations between Lionel Dahmer and his son Jeffrey. Again, giving us a little more insight into the nature of this father-son relationship and the life that Jeffrey Dahmer lived um, and, and how he got to where he ended up, which is right there in court and then in prison and then killed in prison. Um, let's take a listen. I, I was so wrapped up in, in what I was doing. All right. I felt I was going to continue doing that for the rest of my life. He was going to target people specifically. He was going to talk to people and find out what their story was. He was going to find out if they were close to their families. What he was doing was trying to determine if this person that he was conversing with would be missed if they were to disappear. Interesting insight. Let's bring in our guest to get even more insight tonight. A psychologist, researcher, expert on violent crime, and co-author of The New Evil. Uh, Dr. Gary Brucato is back with us tonight in Portland, Oregon. Psychologist and author of The Minds of Mass Killers, Understanding and Interrupting the Pathway of Violence. Siobhan Scott is with us. And in Los Angeles, California, clinical and forensic neuropsychologist, Dr. Judy Ho. Great to see everyone tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, nature versus nurture, Dr. Gary Brucato. When, when we start looking at people like Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, from your perspective, how much of it is they're born and they're, you know, we always say wired differently uh, versus things that happen to them? as he's growing up and as a child and as a teenager, uh, et cetera? I think there's a combination that is required. I think that there are certain brain areas that we know to be abnormal in individuals that have been studied, that have psychopathic character structures, that commit horrendous violent offenses like Dharma committed. And yet 
what it appears is, is that if an individual like that is treated well by the world, loved, cared about, so forth, some of those traits could actually be used in a pro-social way. The individual could be fearless, uh, could be the kind of person who would throw himself on a grenade to save a bunch of people because he's, on, he's not scared, things like that. Uh, but if an individual like that is treated horrendously, they are twisted in the direction, I think, of um, trying to level the playing field. Uh, and then will utilize those those abilities that they have and that ability to shut their emotions down in a horrendous way. Uh, so I think of some of these people as um, having two ingredients uh, that seem to be necessary. Uh, Siobhan, as, as we think about you know the lives and, and, and Jeffrey Dahmer, we're getting a little more insight now into all of that, but for him, it, I, this is fascinating to me that you could be wired a certain way and you can go a good way or you can go a, a completely bad way. And that's got to be tough on the people in a serial killer's life, like a parent or, or a grandparent who, was, who was, has raised this, this child into adulthood and seeing the way they've turned. Yeah, I think they're absolutely devastated by it. And in many cases, perhaps not all, but in many cases, I look at the family members as victims of the whole thing, too, because their lives are changed forever and they, they feel shame, they feel ostracized, and it's it's something that they never get over. So, you know, it's a, a lot to look at and a lot to take apart. And I think there are many, many cases um, where there has been horrendous abuse, but in other cases, and I saw the Dahmer case as one of those where there was an unstable home, there was a mother with mental illness apparently, but I don't know that Dahmer was ever tortured as a child, but I'm sure his parents went over that repeatedly wondering what did they do that caused this. Now, it was interesting at his sentencing, he, he mentioned um, God and prayers, Dr. Judy Ho. Let's take a listen to more from Fox Nation's uh, new docuseries, My Son Jeffrey, The Dahmer Family Tapes, because uh, this issue comes up. Everything his father has wanted to try to, to get him going in the right direction, Jeffrey Dahmer has failed. So now there's Lionel Dahmer saying, what am I going to do with my son? What's left? Have you, have you done any praying at all to God? Not yet. Yeah. No, I haven't. Uh, Why do you feel that you haven't? Can I ask that? Because it's, uh, I feel that, uh, I don't know, I just feel uncomfortable. You yeah. know, because if I fail again, Oh, yeah. you, well, oh, but we're all, I'm failing too. Yeah. Yeah, all the time I'm failing. Continue. I just haven't psyched myself up to, 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 to do that yet. Dr. Judy Ho, how about this, this notion of failure? Growing up, I'm not good at this, I'm not good at that. And then uh, Jeffrey Dahmer apparently found something that he was good at, maybe? Is, is, that, is, is that part of the equation here? What's well, really interesting when we listen to the content of that call and sort of even his tone as he's talking about this idea of failing, it's kind of his biggest fear in many ways. And I can see that in the context of praying in God, the, the type of failure is, what if I fail again? What if I commit another crime? What if I can't repent and, and correct the error of my ways? And it's almost as if, if you start to talk to that you know, higher entity, and you have to start talking about morality and all of these different things, it's gonna create such an enormous amount of cognitive dissonance in Jeffrey that he's have, he would have to then come to terms with all of the terrors that he's committed and still try to wrestle with this idea that maybe he can still be a good person. Maybe it's not too late for him. Maybe he has redeeming qualities. And you can hear his father Lionel trying to tell him that Oh, all of us make mistakes, but I think in some ways, Jeff was just not ready to face up to the enormous amount of dissonance that it would create within himself to have to confront this idea of morality and a higher power and having to answer to that rather than just his own self-doubt and his own struggles with self-esteem from a young age. 
Dr. Gary Brucato, I want to play another clip from Fox Nation's docuseries, my son Jeffrey, the Dahmer Family Tapes, and, and this part talking about isolation and, and how things got out of control. What was supposed to straighten Jeffrey Dahmer out, living with his grandmother, only created a nice isolated space, a private space, for him to continue to act out on these fantasies. He didn't necessarily want to keep killing initially. Um, he did tell me, though, once the killing started, it was such an adrenaline rush. It met his fantasy. Something got terribly out of control. Nothing got resolved at all. It was just a terrible mixture. Do you think that maybe Satan was involved, or? It was just a real strong driving obsession that became more and more uh, powerful. All right, Dr. Gary Brucato, I want to ask you about this. This isolation and fantasy, do they feed off one another? And, and where do these, these types of fantasies come from? It's important to make a distinction between a serial killer of the Dahmer variety and somebody of the, let's say, Ted Bundy variety, who's more of a slick, charming psychopath. Uh, Dahmer was a more socially awkward, mechanical person who wasn't particularly good at uh, connecting with human beings and keeping them around because he was sort of odd. And um, I think originally for him, slipping into killing was all about retaining people forever. Uh, he said that the reason he ultimately began eating people, photographing them, things like that, was that it was a way of keeping them forever, uh, to turning it into a kind of a science where you figured out how to finally get them in a predictable way to be around you so you didn't have to depend upon your, your, your awkward social skills. For people like this in isolation, usually years of either being abused or in the Dahmer case was sort of absent, although his father made an accusation about a, a, a neighbor sexually molesting Dahmer when he was eight years old. Um, but, but for people like Dahmer, it's not that you're treated terribly in the home, it's that it's years of just being really lousy at social relationships. And those are different pathways that could lead to a sense of wanting to level a playing field, you know, being angry at the world, so forth. And in that aloneness, these individuals tend to develop very intense fantasies that ultimately get blended with sexual drives um, that are all about um, dominating and controlling people uh, and, uh, you know, getting them to sort of do what you want them to do so you don't have to rely on your own inadequate self. Uh, and for Dahmer, that took a very particular and very unusual form um, but ultimately, with these serial offenders, there is that same kind of desire for domination control. And the fantasies are, are enough at first, but eventually they have to give way to acting out in increasingly awful ways until that fantasy is perfected. Siobhan Scott, um, he also said something got out of control. What is that something that's getting out of control? Well, I, I think his ability to contain his behavior, you know, it just became obsessive with the desires that he was having. And apparently that was something that continued and got worse over time, as is often the case. Okay, our guests are staying with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about um, the family relationships that serial killers have. And we'll begin by talking about the spouse. Like, how do you have a like a relationship like that for years, sometimes decades, and be doing what they were doing, uh, destroying lives and killing people and all of that. Plus, coming up next hour. In Dedham, Massachusetts, Karen Reed is accused of murdering her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe. But she says it was all a police cover-up, and she's being framed. Tonight, we take a look at the chaos outside the courthouse.
Tragedy in the Hollywood Hills. Prominent therapist Dr. Amy Hardwick found fatally injured under her balcony. Her ex-boyfriend on trial for her murder. She had had a restraining order against him. He strangled her, lifted her up over the balcony and dropped her. He never intended on killing her. Is this a case of a jilted lover turned obsessive stalker? The Hollywood Obsession Murder Trial. Trial coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 central on Court TV. Do you know if he's had any contact with his family? Sure, he, he's had contact with his wife, yes. In what way? And family members. I, I don't think she's visited yet, obviously, because she doesn't want to be ambushed by the press. So she hasn't been, uh, she hasn't visited him at the jail yet, no. All right, that's the attorney for the accused Long Island serial killer who um, is still presumed innocent. Uh, but for the sake of discussion, uh, we're talking about uh, serial killers tonight, and he is... Uh, the highest profile accused serial killer right now in the country, um, arrested for the murders of, of three women. Um, he's married, and he has a family, and has been married for years. And, and I'm wondering about this relationship between this accused serial killer and, and his spouse and his wife. Um, Take a look. Matt Johnson, Court TV crime and justice uh, correspondent, was outside the home of the accused killer and bumped into his wife. How are you holding up? I know you can't talk about the case. How are you holding up? Uh, uh, what you see, right? It is what it is. How's your children doing? Going there. Have you spoken to your husband? And I'm not going there either. That's already been my his lawyer's already answered that question. How are you getting through the how are you getting through the day with media and with all the questions? I know it's it must be by tough. Moment by moment, not hour by hour, moment by moment. Obviously, the aftermath has been excruciating for the, for the family of the accused killer. Uh, here's what uh, the New York Post is, is now reporting on this. The estranged wife of the accused Long Island serial killer is seeking to get all of his legally owned guns returned to her, arguing they are marital property worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, her attorney argues in court that she, in court documents, she has a right to retain ownership of any of the nearly 300 guns that were legally purchased. He also claims any outstanding jewelry, clothing, and cash removed from their home should also be returned uh, to the estranged wife, who said is entitled to at least the marital assets pending the outcome of the divorce. She has filed for divorce at this point. So I want to bring back in my guests, Dr. Gary Brucata, Siobhan Scott, and Dr. Judy Ho. Um, I want to focus right now, before we get to the aftermath of this, right, is like the actual lives that they were living, right? So you've got an accused serial killer, and he's got a wife, and he's got a family, he's got a house. How, how, how could someone potentially balance that, uh, Dr. Judy Ho? Well, Vinny, we see some extreme compartmentalization with some of these serial killers, and this is not the first time that we've seen a serial killer that has a kind of a very ho-hum type of typical normative civilian life. And somehow they're able to still commit these egregious crimes in this other side of their life. And that extreme compartmentalization also speaks to why sometimes when you look at these serial killers and you think about how can they just not even have those emotions, those those reactions that most of us might, you know, the, the lack of empathy that we see with some of these individuals, that compartmentalization allows them to do it. It's almost like this one part of their brain just shuts off so that they can do all of this and then they go back to their civilian life. And sometimes it's also, um, designed that way, meaning they're trying to put on this typical life, be a productive member of the community so that they wouldn't come to the attention of law enforcement or anybody that they live in or have relationships with. Siobhan, Scott, that's, that's, I want to pick up on that point. Do you think a serial killer can actually love their spouse? I, I think 
they attach in perhaps a way that's different than the way the rest of us attach. But they certainly can seemingly connect, they can go through the motions of love, they can be nurturing to their children, but it all goes back to this very unusual way they compartmentalize. Um, July 27th, 2005 in the Wichita Eagle. I wanna read this, this is relative to the uh, BTK um, serial killer. Citing emotional stress, Paula Rader, Dennis Rader's uh, wife at the time, requested and was granted an emergency divorce from the BTK serial killer Tuesday. She had been married to Dennis Rader for 34 years. Sedgwick County District Judge Eric Yost signed the papers the same day they were filed, waiving the 60-day waiting period required for most divorces. Then in, then in 2019, Cosmopolitan uh, did an article following up with her, she, her new last name, Dietz, has never given a public statement about her husband or his crimes. She didn't go to any of his hearings and she's never written to him or visited him in prison. Dr. Gary Brucato, 34 years of marriage. How is, how are you able to keep a secret to that level of that depth, of that darkness that was in this man's life that he's, for 34 years, you're, you know, those of us who are married, you know what, what a marriage is, you know, to become one. Um, how do they, how do you think that happened over the course of 34 years? He's able to keep this deep, deep, dark secret. Well, first of all, when you're dealing with people who compartmentalize, one of the things you want to realize is that they probably have a very black and white idea about the same type of person. So, for example, a woman in the eyes of an individual who commits serious sexual homicide um, might be um, kind of pure or elevated or someone that you would never, you'd never heard a hair on their head. But, it, but then one could go out and um, sexually assault um, victims, torture them, kill them with no more compunction than one would have killing a housefly. Uh, and um, this often has its origins in relationships that the person had in youth with certain female people that they knew, whether it was a mother, uh, women that they knew throughout their lifespan, etc. But the second point that's important to bear in mind is, is something of a misnomer about psychopathic people that they lack empathy. What people really mean when they say that is that they lack compassion. Empathy has to do with the capacity to read a person's face and understand the emotions they probably feel. And because these individuals can do that, they can pretend that they feel compassion towards people, but then they don't. So for example, a person could go into a shopping mall and see a little boy that's become detached from his mother, read that his face is sad and frightened, offer him help, and then take him off somewhere and kill him uh, with no compassion. And so what I think is with some of these people that have these split ideas about certain kinds of people, the family can become this island of purity, this place where people are good and the, the women out in the rest of the world are terrible or something like that. And then there's this ability to kind of do what you should do to act like someone that loves uh, because you can feel what people are feeling. You just don't care about it. Dr. Judy Ho, now looking at the other side of the coin, right, for the, for the spouses. 34 years she's married to this man, and at the moment all of this becomes public, I mean, it's over. I mean, it's, she, she never contacts him. She doesn't talk about him. She doesn't go to court. Nothing completely has, I mean, that has to be such a shock to your system. 34 years of marriage, and then all of a sudden you realize, I don't even know who this guy is. Absolutely, Vinny. And, you know, most of these spouses, that's what they say. They say, I, I had no idea. Really, there were no warning signs. So not only are you living with that shock and just the all of a sudden having been cut off from somebody who you thought you loved and was your family, it's also the questioning of your own decision making going over conversations in your head, going over different moments in your marriage and wondering, did I miss something? Did I not catch something? So it really causes a post-traumatic stress reaction oftentimes for these spouses. And then of course, the isolation and alienation because 
no matter how many good deeds you did and no matter how well respected you were in the community, now you're kind of forever known as the spouse of this serial killer, the spouse of this criminal. And even if you're completely innocent, this is the black mark that is on you now. And you might lose a huge sense of the community that you had before or feel like you can't go out without having to defend yourself or thinking about what people might be saying about you. So I think, of course, the, the lives of the spouses are, are way turned upside down. And sometimes the attention is not on them in a very good way at this very critical time where they need the most help and the most love from their community. All right, everyone staying with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about more family relationships, this time the children. Um, as we go to break, let's take a listen to Dennis Rader in court. Well, I started strangling. The, either the uh, parent broke or he broke his bonds and he jumped up real quick like. I pulled my gun and quickly shot him. I hit him in the head. He fell over. Uh, I could see the blood. And as far as I concerned, he, you know, I thought he was down and uh, was out and then went and uh, started to strangle uh, after Catherine. Then? Uh, strangled her. What did you strangle her with? Pantyhose. Right. What happened then? Uh, kind of like uh, Mrs. Hedge. Uh, I already figured out my, I had a you know, plan on leaving and uh, tr put her in a blanket and drug her to the car, put her in the trunk of the car. So you were able to strangle her to death with these pantyhose? Yes, sir. I, it, it's, it's really chilling when you see how matter-of-factly and unemotionally he can talk about murdering someone, taking someone's life. I mean, it, it's, it's it, they're, they're different. And that's why we're taking a look at all of this tonight. Now, BTK has a daughter um, who's been very um, strong through all this, amazingly strong. Uh, Kerry Rawson is her name. Take a listen. We knew they were looking for BTK, but it wasn't until um, there was a knock on my door by an FBI agent literally saying, like, I need to talk to you. And then he just dropped it and he said, your dad is BTK. Um, and so for us, it was just a total, absolutely shock, completely floored. Um, I went into medical shock. I was shaking for five days. Um, it took three or four days to get me back home due to the media and everything going on. An FBI agent, he's like trying to like question me and get information. I said BTK cuts phone lines and I knew my neighbor's phone line had been cut. And and I knew she had been missing. She had like been taken from her house and found a few weeks later out in the woods and she had been um, strangled. And as a six year old, I knew that. So like these things I knew in 85 now are coming back in 2005 and I'm sitting here alibying my father and defending him. And then all of a sudden I'm literally turning him in on a murder they hadn't arrested him on. And so like your whole world is imploding and you're sitting there starting to like in that first few hours, like realizing like the man you knew that raised you is not who you thought he was. Let's bring back in our guests, Dr. Gary Brucato, Siobhan Scott, and Dr. Judy Ho. Siobhan, the, the parent-child relationship to me is so important. And this is a guy, like, she was being raised by a serial killer, had no idea at all. No idea. Um, how, I, again, like, how can he go down and like help his child and take her fishing when like he's doing all these other things to these families and these and these victims yeah it's it's truly strange for us to try to wrap our mind around that because as carrie has talked about so much and described in her book he was often a wonderful father and very nurturing and taught her so much and loved animals and that was not who he really was. It certainly wasn't all of him. But I think there's always a tendency for us to look at the world in terms of the bad guys and the good guys. And in truth, 
people who are essentially good people most of the time can do bad things under certain circumstances. And people who are in essence perhaps very bad people, people without compassion, people who are cruel, um, can do good things. And that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. It's a little more complicated than the way we usually look at things. And I think for the children of serial killers, they've all got a unique path and a distinct path because they're not all the same. And I hope that they get the support they need and Carrie is on a path of healing. This is her work now, is advocating for victims and trying to shed light on what happened here. And she's doing a, a wonderful thing. Dr. Gary Brucato, um, do serial killers that have these families, do they ever turn on their family and, and hurt family their family? And, and hurt their family? The type of serial killer that we're talking about when we talk about Dennis Rader, um, the type that compartmentalizes, uh, tends to only show glimmers of the dark side of the self, usually when feeling out of control. For example, Kerry Rawson, whom I've interviewed, um, shared with me a story that one day in a moment of becoming very upset about a dish of pasta being spilled at the dinner table, and I asked if perhaps the sauce all over the kitchen floor reminded him of blood. Um, but it was very activating for him. And she said that he suddenly changed. His face changed, his eyes became terrifying, and he began to strangle her brother. In that moment, the mask fell away and he was BTK. And, um, you know, so when we talk about this compartmentalization, I remember there are still going to be little glimmers here and there. Another very common thing is for the wife or the part, the female partner in the relationship to pick up some strange requests, some fantasies and so forth that play out during lovemaking. So that you start to get little hints of somebody who has a, a, a kind of a double life and a lot of um, uh, hostility hidden inside, a kind of a fire, and, uh, and the individual can be perverse. Uh, and little hints of that come out. I also think, as a final point, that some of these offenders have a secret wish for the people around them to discover what they are, to bridge the split in the self. Uh, and sometimes there's a flirtation with that by doing things like um, keeping photographs of persons, their own crimes in a box hidden somewhere in the house, uh, bringing your partner out for a romantic uh, activity that is near where a body is, is festering that you that you have left there because in some psychological way the individual wishes that the curtain would be pulled away and you would see this fantasy self that is strong and confident and powerful whereas everybody around them kind of thinks they're a schlub uh, so that there's a little bit of a wish for that for some of these people and I think um, you know when the family gets horrified and shocked and then some time passes on they start to say eh, there were little glimmers here and there that he, that he was a control freak or that he could be really nasty with the neighbors or things like that. I'm yet to see a serial killer that was 100% perfect with the family and awful out in the world. It's just there's a, the balance is a little different. Dr. Judy Ho, I want to uh, read something that was um, a letter to the court from the daughter of the Golden State Killer. And this is what she wrote. I could never tell you all the things my father did for me. This is the, she's talking about the Golden State Killer, her father, because he always put me and my daughter first, all of our lives, so there were far too many. He is the best father I could have had and my daughter could have had. He was my daughter's grandfather, but he treated her like his daughter. Anything my daughter or I ever needed, he provided. How about that, Dr. Judy Ho? Wow. Well, I think we're speaking all to a lot of the same themes here about how extreme that compartmentalization can go. And also, I think there's a big self-justification process in many of these criminals' minds. So there are people in the world who deserve their wrath, and then there are people who deserve their love. And even if they love differently and show it in different ways, I do think that they have some kind of capacity for that kind of human connection. And it may be isolated, it may be few, but whoever is in their good graces, they're going to show that positive side to those individuals and I think for most for most criminals when they go back and they think about what they did I think that there is that sense of they knew right from wrong but they also justified it to themselves that it was okay to treat certain people in these horrible horrific egregious ways and then whatever capacity they have left to care 
that is going to be left for the very select few. And I think that you're seeing a portrait of that here as his daughter is describing the Golden State Killer. Dr. Judy Ho, Siobhan Scott, Dr. Gary Brucato, um, thank you so much. Great information, incredible insight. Really appreciate your time tonight.